It's endlessly fascinating. That's the thing about it. You know, when you, when you start woodworking, you buy wood at the lumberyard. But then something clicks in your head and you go, where does this stuff come from? So I decided to find out. So I went into the forests and it, it was just this incredible epiphany that there's millions of kinds of wood. The woods that are available in lumberyards are there because of, they grow in large stands, oaks and maples, cherry. But there's, there's you know, all these other woods in the forest. There's, there's honey locusts, there's sycamore, there's catalpa, there's hornbeam, there's hop hornbeam, you know, elm, red elm, white elm. Once you break through the, the barrier of lumberyards and become uh, aware of the incredible range of woods everywhere in all different scales, you never stop finding it. Well, that's also what led to my landscape work was when I got into these forests, the complexity of the forest was, it was just like mesmerizing. You know, there's all the trees, but then there's the understory trees, the dogwoods and, and red buds, and, and then there's the shrubs and the mountain laurels, then there's the mosses and the, and all of a sudden there's this, all because I wanted to know where the trees grew. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then I started planting for myself in my gardens. But the way it really happened was I was at a party one night with this woman. She had a, a barren wasteland of a deck in Boston. And she said, God, I'd really like to have something up there. I really need something. It's so hard to define. All, all I want is paradise. And I said, perfect. I can do this. I have a, a, a tendency to say, sure, I can do that. You know, and then I go, go look it up, read about it, study it. You know, like somebody asked me to do a pool once. Yeah, I can do a pool. I had no idea how to build a pool. But then I did a little homework and kept one day ahead of the builders, learning the different kinds of... So yeah, that led a roof job in Boston that was quite successful led to uh, a lot of landscape work on a fairly large scale, including a, a golf course. I, I, yeah, I see, I can do that, yeah. In the context of what I do is, it's essentially solving problems for specific needs. A table, a landscape, uh, an interior, a cutting board, uh, whatever. Just give me, give me your, your need and I will solve the problem based on what, you, what information you give me. Do you stain wood? And the, and the answer is I don't stain anything. I pick the wood to create the mood that the person expects. I want a dark wood. Well, you don't pick a light wood and put some shoe polish on it. You pick a dark wood and let the wood talk to itself. And look at this range of natural tones that are available just by picking the right wood. So you got a beech, a madrone, an oak, a juniper, a bobinga, honey locust, poplar, walnut, oak, uh, yellow pine, cherry, ash, walnut, maple. What color wood do you want? <laughs> this range of opportunity made every day more interesting because you weren't pulling out the same old damn cherry. Grapevine wood. This is boxwood and we made drawer pulls out of it. It doesn't have to be big. Princewood, Florida. Anything that sounds like that, you can make things out of it. This is Ohio Buckeye. English Barberry. This is plum. Lilac. Privet wood. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Either I've got an idea that I want to make or I've been given a, a request from somebody. We sketch and lots and lots and lots and lots of sketches, pages and pages of sketches. That, that is the most fun process. The, the sketches develop and then we pull the wood. I cannot work without a pile of wood in front of me that I'm working with. I can't draw something and then go find something to make it out of. I let the wood tell me what we can do with it. So you're, you're developing a full-scale working drawing, which is everything necessary for any of us in the shop to look at, see the wood, and make the piece. Everybody has to be able to jump in at any point. So then the wood gets cut out, 
and you start to mill the wood. And as you're milling the wood, you know, which is which is which is getting rid of the saw marks, and you start to see more opportunity. Oh, this I didn't see, I didn't realize this had this. Hmm, there's a little more here than I thought. So you go back to the drawing board and you change the drawing, and then you start the joinery, whatever it might be. And that is the process. You know, mill it, join it, shape it, finish it, and cash it in. <laughs> yeah. Maybe take a picture, you know. I was born in Stanford, Connecticut in 1946. Nine months after my father got home from the war. <laughs> More or less. <laughs> I went to BU. I went to college because my parents insisted. But then I stayed in school to stay out of the army because there was a war going on. And if you stayed in school, it, you, know, you were counting that maybe it'll be over. I majored in, in photojournalism. And what was cool about photojournalism was it was the first time I'd done anything with my hands and my mind as opposed to just writing. I had a camera. I had a tool. It was fabulous. I loved it. And it might have saved my life because when I got out of college, of course, the war was still going on and I got drafted, but they made me a photojournalist. They let you out of the Army early if you go back to college. As soon as I heard that, I applied, applied to a school in New York and I applied to RISD. No portfolio, wish and a prayer, and, I got, and they let me in. Okay, so I'm, 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 a, I'm a photo major at RISD and I have to take an elective class. I flip a coin, it's either clay or wood. It came up heads, I took wood. But the really transformative moment was the first day of class, Tay Frid, this incredible guy who changed my life, with his coat and tie, comes into the first day of class and takes off his coat, rolls up his sleeves, go out into the alleyway behind the wood shop where there's a steaming cauldron of, in a pipe, grabs a piece of wood, I didn't know what it was, comes into the shop and ties it in a knot. Well, that was it. And at the end of uh, the year, Fred said, you want to be a grad student in woodworking? And I said, yeah. And that was the end of cameras. Yeah. <laughs> As you see, it's 45 years later, and we're surrounded by it, aren't we? Creating pieces that are enjoyable to make out of interesting, unusual, dramatic woods uh, using uh, kind of traditional methods. And what's changed? What's ch the wood is still beautiful. The joinery is the same. What's changed is I always got to be making something different. Will there be, can there be, should there be a continuum where there's a, the youngsters like downstairs segue into their own shops and continue to produce? I don't know. It's hard to say. It's like uh, Heppelwhite. It's like uh, Art Nouveau. It's like Art Deco. It's like, I don't know what they call it, but what, what you're seeing here is a period. They all end. Poof. Who knows why? <laughs> For me, it's going to be just, you know, a matter of I'm just going to, you know, turn off the light one day and it'll be over. Or maybe the light will turn out on me 